Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this Saturday afternoon session among our Discover Boston College Open House series. This session is specifically focused on information about applying to Boston College via early decision, information about applying to Boston College as a human-centered engineering major, and then also information about the Cabelli Presidential Scholars Program. My name is Grant Gosselin. I serve as Director of Undergraduate Admission, and on behalf of our entire staff, I welcome you here this afternoon. I hope that this information is helpful to all of you. You'll note at the bottom of your screen a question and answer chat feature. I would ask you to please feel free to forward any questions that you might have that are relevant to these specific topics today in that chat box, in that Q&A box. Uh, we're going to reserve the first portion of this presentation uh, to talk a little bit about early decision and human-centered engineering. So if you have questions at this point relevant specifically to those areas, please do put them in the chat. I have colleagues behind the scenes that will be addressing those in real time. Then we're going to invite a colleague of mine, Susan Migliarisi, one of our associate directors here, and a panel of four undergraduate Boston College students who are members of the Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program. And we've invited them here today to talk a bit about their experiences in the program and to answer questions from the audience. So when we move to that portion of the presentation, I would invite you to please put forward any questions that you might have specifically of our student panelists. So without further ado, I again will get started at this moment and I'm going to share my screen to walk you through a little bit of information about applying to Boston College to begin as an early decision candidate. Now, Boston College has, is relatively new to offering early decision. For many years, we offered early action, and we made the decision last year to move to a binding early decision program. And there were many reasons for that, and many students in the past, when they had thought about applying early to college, they were doing so to be able to learn about their admission to a very small number of colleges and universities. And we had uh, over the years, seen that, uh, that reality change quite a bit, where the last year that we offered early action, we had over 16,000 students apply during the early action round, and it was very difficult for us to really assess which students were most serious about Boston College. So we decided to introduce early decision, and we've just completed our first cycle, so we do have some data to share with you today that might help you determine if applying as an early decision candidate might be the right match or might right fit for you. So just to begin to make sure from a, a terminology standpoint, we understand what early decision is. Early decision is a binding admission process where students who view a school as their top choice institution uh, apply during the early round. They sign an agreement alongside their parents or guardian, as well as their school counselor that assures the admission committee that if admitted, they will enroll at Boston College and withdraw all other active applications that they have uh, out, out there. Uh, it, it also uh, it has off, uh, presented some questions because we do have two rounds of early decision. We have early decision one, which carries a November 1st deadline, and early decision two, which carries a January 1st deadline. A lot of people will ask what the difference is between those two programs. There really is no difference other than the, than the deadline itself. For some of our students, that really view Boston College as their clear and cut first choice, early decision one is going to be the way that most of those students will likely apply. But there are some students, particularly in this year where it's been more difficult to see campuses or learn about colleges and universities on your list, that might not be quite ready to make a commitment on November 1st. And so we do offer a second opportunity on January 1st for those students that might make their decision to uh, commit to an institution like Boston College by that date. The reality is we also know that there are some students that might have Boston College and another school neck and neck, and they really have two schools that they might really want to attend. Uh, they might perhaps decide to apply early to that other school first, and if it doesn't work out, then it provides them a second opportunity during the early decision two round. So that's the reason for the two rounds. Now, what are the benefits for uh, students, uh, for, for colleges rather, with early decision? I mentioned to you a bit before that we were really challenged by the reality that so many students were applying to us during the early action round in years past. 
Um, it allows us to really understand which students are the right fit for Boston College. And that's what this college application search is really all about. Students trying to find the colleges that will really provide them with all of the tools and resources they need to achieve their goals. And colleges and universities looking to find the right students that will add the most to the campus environment, will take advantage of all the resources that we offer, and really will be uh, really good citizens of the community. It allows colleges also to secure some portion of their class earlier on in the applicant cycle. So colleges and universities uh, admit a lot of students, more students than they have room to enroll. And much of that is uh, done behind the scenes as we look at past historical data around the likelihood of enrollment of students once admitted. And we make some forecasts in terms of how many students we need to admit in order to fill our class. And so having some portion of the class established earlier on in the process from an enrollment management standpoint does help those colleges and universities uh, to really become much closer to achieving those final goals that they have. It also allows us to build a community of students that really connect with BC's values from the moment they submit their enrollment deposit. You know, when you apply to colleges, uh, as you know, you'll have many of them, perhaps, that you might apply to. And hopefully, those are all schools you'd be really excited about. Um, early decision candidates know right up front that they have a clear and fast number one choice. And they have done their research, they've done their homework, and they've really established that Boston College is exactly the place that they want. The mission, the values of the institution are very much aligned with their own. And so uh, they don't need to take much time when they arrive on campus to begin to understand the, the ethos of the institution. They really have that figured out already. And that allows us, again, to, uh, to do more with our students to allow them to go further in their, uh, their college goals. So what are the benefits for you as applicants? I think that's really important. This isn't just about colleges. This is mostly about students. Uh, it allows students, first and foremost, who view Boston College as their choice, uh, to raise their hand and be identified. And when you look at an applicant pool like Boston College's, last year, we received about 30,000 applications. And this uh, is exciting, I think, for us as we evaluate those applications. We uh, really look forward to getting to know the students who apply to Boston College. But there are a lot of students that apply to Boston College who are academically qualified. Uh, last year, the middle 50% range uh, for the SAT, for example, we have moved to a test optional model for the coming year. But last year, we had it as a requirement for all students. The middle 50% range for the SAT among admitted students was between uh, 12, 1410 and 1520 and between 33 and 35 for the ACT. The reality is not only did we admit about 25% of those applicants that fit those ranges, but there were over 8,000 students last year who were within those ranges or above those ranges that were not offered admission to Boston College. And chances are there were students among those that really would have enrolled at Boston College if provided the opportunity. We didn't know that during the regular decision round, and certainly we didn't know that during the early action round in previous years. There were also students in the regular decision round that we did offer admission to that didn't view Boston College as their top choice and decided to enroll somewhere else. And that's certainly their prerogative and, and we wish them well. But you understand, you begin to understand the uncertainty that colleges have as we are extending offers. And we really do want to make sure that the, it is the right match for both the student and for BC. So by applying early decision, you're identifying yourself right up front. You're telling us that you've done your homework, that you have investigated Boston College through programs like this, perhaps through some of our other virtual programming that we've offered, and you know this is the right place for you. So that, that way half the match is, has been made already. It also increases your chances of admission at, at top college. And I'm gonna spend some time in a moment showing you a little bit about what our applicant pool looked like to help demonstrate that fact. Finally, we also talked to a lot of students over the years who, as much as this process is exciting uh, to go through and try to figure out where you're going to enroll, we know it is also a process filled with anxiety. And it is, by the end of the process, one that many students are just happy to be done with. And for students that really have been able to find that match through early decision, it allows you to be done with this college search by December of your senior year and be able to move on and enjoy the, the second half of your senior year without having to worry 
about where you're headed off to college. Now, one of the criticisms of early decision nationally is that it tends to, to benefit families that don't need to worry about financial aid. If you're able to make a commitment that you'll enroll if admitted, uh, you, many families uh, that are able to do that might not be as concerned about financial aid. And Boston College, when we made the decision to move to adopt early decision, that was something we cared very deeply about. And we felt that we were well positioned to push back against that narrative because Boston College is one of only 20 private universities in the country that is both need blind in the admission process and meets the full demonstrated financial need of every student we admit. We offer one of the most generous financial aid programs in the nation. Last year, about $150 million awarded through need-based aid. This year, closer to $170 million, given the impacts of COVID-19 on the financial circumstances of many families, we adapted our budget and grew it accordingly. So Boston College puts forward exceptional financial aid packages. Now, whether you apply at early decision or regular decision, that package you'll receive will be the same. There's no discount that we're you know, providing for students uh, you know, at early decision where you might need a certain amount and we're not gonna quite give you that amount because you're gonna enroll, so why would we spend that money? There are some colleges and universities that think like that, but certainly not Boston College. Now, if financial aid is a concern for you and your family, and that's the only thing holding you back from an early decision application, we would encourage you to spend some time on our website, and I put the link here, bc.edu slash afford, where you can fill out some very quick net price calculators. We have two of them, in fact. One of them will take you all of three minutes. It asks sim six simple questions about your family's largest uh, financial um, investments, uh, your home, perhaps, if you own one at all, any sort of uh, mortgage that you might hold, those types of basic questions. And it will provide you with a range of where your financial aid would fall if admitted to Boston College with about a 90 to 95% confidence level. So it's a very good estimator. If you'd like a closer range, uh, we would ask you to fill out the second tool, which is our net price calculator. That's a little bit more complicated. It will probably require your parents to pull out last year's taxes and put in some uh, more detailed information, but it will provide you with an even closer range of where that financial aid is likely to fall. And for students that are able to complete those and they feel comfortable that if their award fell anywhere within that range that they could make it work, then early decision is a great option for you. There is an outlet uh, for a student. If a student were to fill out those calculators, receive an award uh, in the end, and it wasn't quite what they expected, um, we would certainly work with that family through our financial aid office. Um, but but if, if a student couldn't make it work financially, certainly we would release them of that binding commitment. Now, Boston College also offers our presidential scholarship. I'm not going to tell you too much about it quite yet. I'm going to save that to the second half of our program. But that scholarship is available to all applicants, regardless of when they apply, whether early decision or regular decision, as long as they're meeting the priority scholarship deadline of November 1st. And this is also something that I'm really proud about. There are colleges and universities that may choose not to award merit scholarships to early decision candidates because they know those students are coming anyway. Um, that's not our philosophy at Boston College. We certainly make this scholarship available uh, to early decision candidates, and you'll have the opportunity to meet one of those students in just a few moments. Now, I did mention a little bit earlier about the admit rate uh, and how there can be a benefit to students in terms of admission if, if early decision is part of your, your plans. Last year, as you see, we received about 2,700 early decision applications, and that's a combination from early decision one and early decision two. There were about 1,700 applications at early decision one and about 1,000 applications at early decision two. But the admit rate was almost identical in both of them, about 37% combined, and about 40% of the class came from those 2,700 applications. So, Again, it really allowed us to see students that had all the same academic qualifications. There was no degradation in quality of their applicants. They were strong students academically. They were engaged in their communities, all the things that we seek during our process. But we knew that those students really wanted to be at Boston College, and so we were willing to go a little deeper in terms of our admit rate for those students. You see almost 10 times as many applications during the regular decision round, almost 27,000 applications um, for that uh, pool. Our admit rate, uh, about 24%. Before we admitted any students on the waiting list, it was about 22%. 
So a pretty uh, wide range from the early decision rate to the regular decision rate. We did fill a little more than half of the class uh, during the regular decision process, but by doing the math, you can see from a proportion of applications, um, a larger proportion came from that early decision pool relative to the number of applications. So just gives you a sense, again, that if, if Boston College is where you want to be or among your top choices and you're trying to split hairs about which one you might uh, elect as your top choice school, just know that there can be a benefit in terms of the admit rate there. To remind you again, our deadlines for uh, admission to Boston College, November 1st for early decision one, January 1st for early decision two or regular decision, and all students who submit their applications by November 1st are eligible for presidential scholarship consideration. There's no separate application required to be eligible for that merit scholarship. Let me now move gears uh, just very quickly to talk a little bit about human-centered engineering at Boston College. I'm not going to spend time going in depth in terms of promoting the program itself, telling you about the curriculum, the faculty, all of those things, because we've already run a session. Uh, so if you are interested in learning more about human-centered engineering at Boston College and have not seen it, would encourage you to go to bc.edu slash visit. It's the same website you use to learn about this program. And at the bottom of that page, all of our video content, on-demand video content from past presentations is listed there. So uh, if you'd like to go and watch that program at your leisure, you're welcome to do that. If you love this program so much that you want to watch it a second time, it'll be available in a couple of days. Uh, but for those uh, very quickly that uh, might not be as familiar or that need a refresher, our human-centered engineering major really is one that seeks to bring together students that have an appreciation, a deep appreciation for uh, technology and STEM fields that have a strong math and science background, but are also deeply interested in the liberal arts that understand that the world's 21st century problems around health, energy, and the environment require interdisciplinary solutions. And that really was the genesis for us beginning the human-centered engineering degree. We've opted to make this a general engineering degree that can be malleable and, and change as the conditions do and that, that the, the needs around uh, these 21st century problems evolve. That these engineers will be able not only to design new technologies, but also interact personally with the people they'll serve to ensure that their solutions really are meeting the needs of what the world uh, is facing. And the reality is, you know, 90% of the world's technologies today are built for just 10% of the world's population. And as a Jesuit Catholic university that is committed to educating men and women for others, that really believes that education is best used when it is not only focused on personal gain, but for the betterment of society, we think that the human-centered engineering is, is a, an obligation we have uh, to be training our engineers to be thinking this way. So as we're looking through applications, if you choose to apply to the human-centered engineering major this year, we are looking for those students who are able to identify and, and communicate to us that their goals really are to think about using technology from a social justice standpoint. How do they want to think about using their engineering degree to improve society? We are looking specifically for students that are very interested in a highly technical engineering degree, but equally interested in a strong world-class liberal arts education. Those things go hand in hand with this program. And it really is what sets this program apart from traditional engineering programs. And then we're also, I think it's really important from a value statement to make sure you know we're looking for a very diverse group of engineers in our cohort. We want to make sure that the challenges that we face in our society with the lack of uh, the disproportionate uh, lack of women, uh, students of color, lower socioeconomic uh, backgrounds are in the STEM fields that we're remedying that in our program. And so that is something that we are specifically looking for uh, as we are shaping this class, just like we are always looking to do in the general student body. So for those of you looking to apply into the major, the first thing that you need to know is that when you make your application to Boston College, you're going to be asked to apply to one of our four undergraduate divisions, the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences, the Carroll School of Management, the Lynch School of Education and Human Development, and the Connell School of Nursing. Students applying to the human-centered engineering major should apply directly into the Morrissey College because that is where it's located. 
Now, as we are beginning this program, this is the very first year we're offering human-centered engineering. We imagine there will be two types of applicants uh, to this major. There will be those students that absolutely are convinced that they will study engineering in college. And so if not admitted into the human-centered engineering major at BC, those students are likely not interested in other majors. They're going to simply go to another engineering school to which they've been admitted. The second type of student we believe will be so enamored with Boston College that studying engineering would be icing on the cake. They certainly, that's their goal, but they could see the benefits of the brand new integrated science and engineering center, the $160 million center that is, will be open next year, the benefits of the Schiller Institute for Integrated Society, that they could still achieve their goals at Boston College while studying something other than engineering, physics, uh, chemistry, um, a number of other areas that they could use to achieve their goals. And so students are, will be provided the opportunity to tell us whether they would like to be considered for another major or admission to the, the Morrissey College outside of human-centered engineering, if not selected for the engineering program. The reason we're providing that is that our program will be small. We'll be bringing in just 25 engineers in this first cohort. It will follow, but in subsequent years, there will be 50 students admitted each year, ultimately 200 engineering students over the course of four years at Boston College. But in this first cohort, we are starting small. And so there will be highly qualified students that apply to the program that we're simply not able to admit. And so that's why we're encouraging students that would still be interested in attending Boston College if not selected for engineering to dictate that during the application process. Now we're also encouraging students to apply to or via early decision if attending Boston College as an engineering major is their goal. Because it is so small, we have to make sure that we don't over enroll the program. And because early decision students make a commitment to enrolling, it does provide us the security to know that those students really are going to be in the class if admitted. So we anticipate filling a large number of those spaces uh, via early decision. And so it would be to your benefit to think about that. I will point out, however, that if you do select that second major and you do apply early decision, if you're admitted to Boston College in either place, uh, human-centered engineering or another major, that binding commitment would be uh, still in, intact. So if uh, you would only be interested in enrolling at BC because of engineering, uh, we would again encourage you not to select a second major. Finally, we do ask all of our students to complete a supplemental essay uh, prompt. Uh, many of our students, most of our students will have four different options that are outlined on the common application and on our website. Uh, and those students have a choice between those four major, those four uh, supplemental essay prompts. Human-centered engineering majors will be asked to complete the fifth essay prompt. Um, they will not have a choice. Um, this will be part of their application for the engineering major. You can see it here, I won't reread it. I'm sure many of you have read it already. Uh, it is also listed on our website, but it does really try to remind students about the goals of the human-centered engineering major and to ask them a bit about how this program would help them achieve their goals uh, around achieving the greater good. So let me at this point begin to introduce a little bit about the Presidential Scholars Program, and then I'm gonna ask our panelists to turn on their computers in just a moment, their video screens rather. But the Gabelli Presidential Scholars uh, Program is the only merit-based program at Boston College. I mentioned already our commitment to need-based financial aid at Boston College. Because we're awarding over $150 million a year, um, there is really not a lot of money left over for merit scholarships, but we do really commit quite well to the programs that we do offer. The Gabelli is one of the most uh, generous programs that you'll find anywhere. It is a full tuition scholarship awarded for all four years to a group of 15 incoming students. So it is a highly selective admission process. Students, as I mentioned earlier, do need to apply by that November 1st deadline. Last year, we had about 8,000 students that did that. And those students' applications were evaluated by our admission committee in the months of November and December. And we then invited about 50 finalists to interview for that scholarship from which we enrolled each year a class of about 15 scholars. So that's generally the process that students go through, but the program benefits are extraordinary. Not only is it a full tuition scholarship uh, that could increase if you have financial need beyond that level, uh, financial aid could cover your room and board as well. 
students, but it's also a program. And it's a program that is sustained over the course of the four years that challenges students to come together on a regular basis throughout each semester, engaging in lecture series and dialogue about different uh, speakers that they're hearing. It allows students the opportunity to have fully funded summer programs, including a summer where they will live on campus and study social justice issues and volunteer in the city of Boston, a summer for international travel where they'll choose locations around the world to immerse themselves in study uh, of culture and languages, uh, opportunities for internships and detailed research opportunities on campus, and then during spring breaks, the opportunities to have international excursions as a cohort of presidential scholars, all fully funded by the program. So it's an extraordinary program. I would encourage you, if you're interested in the program, to uh, apply by November 1st, just about five weeks from now. But at this point, I'm going to introduce our panel and I'm going to ask them to turn on their cameras and I'm going to turn off this presentation in just a moment. But my colleague Susan Migliarisi is joined by Jacob Kelleher, a senior at Boston College, Arub Youssef, a junior, Julia Kim, a sophomore, and Fran Hodgins, who just began his freshman year a few weeks ago. So let me stop sharing my screen. I'm going to turn off my video at this point and turn this presentation over to my colleague Susan Migliarisi. Thank you, Grant. Um, I am thrilled to be here with all of you this afternoon and even more thrilled to be with our four Gabelli scholars. I've had the privilege to work with the Gabelli program for 19 years um, and it's an absolute joy. So I want to turn it over to the students first to have them introduce themselves to you all and I think we'll start with um, senior first to Jacob and then move down to uh, Rube and then Julia and Fran and then we'll reverse it when we start asking some questions. So over to you Jacob. Thank you, Sue. Um, my name is Jacob, and as you saw from Grant's slide, I'm from just outside Chicago, Illinois, from Glen Ellen, and I'm a secondary education and math double major, and I have a theater minor, and I'm senior, and I do a lot of theater on campus. It's one of the things I'm really involved in. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Arub. I'm from Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. I'm studying perspectives, which is technically a philosophy major and environmental studies, and I'm pre-med. Um, so nice to meet you all. We're having a little technical difficulty. Try again, hon. Working now. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm Julia Kim. I'm a sophomore from Louisville, Kentucky, and I'm studying um, biochemistry with a minor in finance, and I am also on the pre-medical track. And I am Fran Hodgins. I'm a freshman. I'm from Hopedale, Massachusetts, and I'm studying accounting for finance and consulting in the School of Management. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Fran, I just wanted to start with you because you're probably closest to the admission process um, versus everyone else. Can you talk a little bit about why you decided to apply to BC? And you did apply through early decision. So can you talk through that process for you and, and how you ended up doing that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, BC was a college that was pretty familiar to me. Um, I mean, not super familiar in that I pretty much knew Alumni Stadium and Gasson Hall. But um, I went to a few tailgates, et cetera, and I really decided I wanted to take a closer look. I did Eagle for a day, um, and I really just connected with the students on campus. I found everyone kind of really highly motivated. Um, they cared for each other instead of, it wasn't the like hyper-competitive um, culture you might see elsewhere. And uh, so I was going through the application process, and I was thinking, if I got in anywhere else, would I still go to BC? And at the end of the day, I was kind of like, yeah, I think I would. I mean, I really loved the campus culture. I've seen excellent outcomes from BC. So I got really excited about it. I said, you know what, I'm going to know where I'm going to go to college by Christmas, hopefully. Um, and that was kind of my process for ED. Thank you, Jacob. Um, once a student applies and applies by that November 1 deadline, as Grant mentioned, we then in our office kind of call out a group that we discuss in committee. And then we 
make it a little bit smaller and invite those students to interview for the scholarship. And it's a, it's a pretty intense process, um, the selection process. Um, it's over the course of three days and the students go through a number of interviews, uh, group kind of situations, um, some mock seminars and things like that. So I just want to throw it out to Julia. Can you talk a little bit about your experience when you came through the selection process um, and maybe not only um, what you kind of your expectations were and how they were met, but also what surprised you about going through the process? Yeah, um, so I know that when I was looking at schools, I think what was most important to me was being part of an academically rigorous setting, but also feeling like I was supported, comfortable, and just kind of uplifted by the students around me. And it wasn't so much of a negatively competitive environment. So when I was reflecting on my selection week, and I actually remembered um, when I first introduced myself to Sue, and she knew my name, she remembered my application, and that really stood out to me, just because I realized how much time and energy went into preparing for us to be there. And I think what was most surprising is how by the end, it was a very relaxing and fun experience that all of us had because my biggest fear going into the interviews was just that it's gonna be full of trick questions or that I was gonna be evaluated constantly. But I just really realized that everyone that was interviewing me was more interested in who I really was, what I was passionate about and out things outside of what was in my application. So that was really awesome. I think it was a really fun and just awesome experience as a whole. I'm always surprised by the, not surprised, but I'm always heartened by the end of Gabelli selection process. Um, that there are a lot of friendships that are made and connections, a lot of hugs and tears, and it's only been a few days. So I always um, love that time of year with all of you. Um, and then when you get to campus, I have the pleasure of spending even more time with all of you. Um, just because you pop by my office or you become part of the student admission program. But a lot of your lives certainly um, have to do with the Gabelli process and being part of that group. So I, I think one of the main things um, as a Gabelli scholar is that you have a lot of relationships with faculty members. So Rube, can you talk a little bit about that? You're kind of how you've made um, connections with faculty and if you've been involved with any research and how that's kind of grown for you. Sure, yeah, as you said, Sue, um, faculty mentorship in the program is a, is a staple. Um, and as freshmen, we're each paired with a faculty mentor um, in our course of study. Um, so for me, I was paired with a philosophy professor who's interested in the philosophy of science and particularly of environmental science, which is very niche, but very cool. Um, so I'm able to just speak with her about class recommendations, just um, really anything, life in general. Um, she's a great resource um, and in general through the program, um, we're also able to meet many different professors um, and it was because of the connections that I made through the program that I was able to be in touch with um, Dean Yadama in the School of Social Work. Um, and I began research in the School of Social Work with a professor, Professor Maria Pinaras Liano, who works with um, Latinx immigrants in the US and is developing a mental health intervention to best um, assimilate people who come to Boston particularly. Um, and then I also work with her on a different project based in Colombia that works with Venezuelan refugees coming to Colombia and it's um, developing a family-based intervention to address the mental health needs of those refugees. Um, so these are areas that I never expected to work in as a high schooler. Um, research wasn't even on my agenda, let alone research like this. So it's super duper cool. Um, I was actually able to go to Columbia last year, right before uh, we were sent home. <laughs> so in March um, with my professor, which um, was an incredible experience. I was able to do field work with her. Um, so all of these opportunities were essentially made possible um, through my connections um, with the program or that the program facilitated more or less. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much. And you know, another piece of the program, I think when he, students hear like academic merit scholarship, 
often there's a lot of focus on the fact that it's a full tuition scholarship. And of course, that's incredibly important. But I think what's unique in some ways about Gabelli is that it really embodies the Jesuit missions, um, particularly about being part of the global community um, and working toward a more just world. And that your program isn't just about the academic scholarship and the opportunities that you have, you know, so that you can be um, a better person, but how can you use that to help the common good? That's kind of part of being part of a Gabelli scholar. Um, so Jacob, can you talk a little bit about both the social justice action project that all the sophomore classes do, that is part of the program, that um, the sophomore class puts on a social justice project um, for the entire BC community. So can you talk a little bit about the, what your class did that year? And then also touch on the international experiences that you've had through the Gabelli program. Yeah, I think you said it very well, Sue, and that this program's unlike anything else I've ever seen in the way that it really teaches you how to be someone who can really change the world in a really tangible way beyond just the classroom. So for that social justice project that we do, every sophomore class together, all 15 of us, settle on one issue that um, the world really could use some improvement on. And it's an issue of social justice, it's an issue, it's an issue of equality generally. And my class two years ago decided to focus on the geography of opportunity, which we kind of coined the term ourselves, but it's the idea that where you are or where you're born severely limits or severely um, solidifies the kind of life you can have. And there were a lot of things that were encompassed in that, like your, access, your um, access to transportation, the kind of school that you went to, those kinds of things can set you on a track for life that you don't really have control over. Um, so first semester, you for this project, every class does one event first semester and one event second semester. And in our first semester, we hosted a panel with some local experts from Boston and it was not like this because it's on Zoom, but it was very similar to this and that we had a panel and people asked questions and it was more just to educate the community about the issue and what we wanted to say about it. And then in the second semester, we did something that made it a little bit more personal and really showed the impact of it. So we had people from Boston come in and tell their experience with this issue personally and share their stories in a theatrical setting, which was super cool because it united the arts in this issue in a very impactful, powerful way. Um, but just this concept of having to do that project and get really acquainted with such an important issue on a very personal level and then create something tangible at it that the whole community here at BC can benefit from is so unique and so great. And working on a team on that, it's unlike anything I've ever been a part of, which was really exciting. But then even beyond that, we have these international experiences where we go to Italy and Costa Rica and uh, to the Middle East for sure. And then you also get to go to your choice of location for a summer. And on these trips, one of the core things we always talk about is social justice. We talk about what we can do uh, as a community to help these countries, what we can learn from these countries, because it's not just a one-way transaction. They don't just need things from us. Um, and a lot of times when you travel, you do a lot of touristy things, which is really fun. But when we go on these trips, we like meet a government agencies, maybe government official, officials, and uh, we go to NGOs and we meet with really important people who can share with us these important issues and how we can help and what that means. Um, and I feel like I just know so much more about our world and what our place in the world can be just from having gone on all these experiences. And I'm just so fortunate that the program's been able to provide me with those things. Thank you, Jacob. Um, and we had a question about the other classes and in their sophomore year um, for Rube, what did you all do last year? And Julia, what are you guys working on for this year, especially with the limitations in terms of events and being in person? Yeah, we did ours on wrongful convictions, which at the time and obviously still is a very germane topic. Um, so we had panelists come in, there were law school professors, and there was someone who works directly with people who are wrongfully convicted. Um, and we made just a presentation that was open to the BC community um, about the issue at hand. Of course, the spring semester portion of the project was canceled, um, but nevertheless, I thought it was a very impactful uh, project. 
And this year we're actually doing a project on racial disparities in the United States healthcare system as exposed by COVID-19. So we were trying to do something very relevant to the pandemic that we're in and we're going to put on a panel in October um, by a couple of professionals in the Boston area talking about just the underlying factors that lead to these kind of disproportionate effects of COVID-19. Great, thank you. Um, we also had some questions uh, from the chat. We're, the students were kind of wondering, um, what about you in high school that you think um, made you interesting to those of us in the admission office? What about the extracurriculars or things that you did that possibly led us to um, look at you as a Gabelli Scholar candidates? I I don't Go ahead, Jacob. Please, Aru. Okay. I was going to say, I don't think there was one particular thing um, that stood out. And that being said, I think it's important for seniors who are applying to keep in mind that um, you shouldn't cater the activities that you want to get involved with to the scholarship and to your application. Um, so some of the things I did in high school, um, I, was in very, or I was very involved in environmental lobbying. I worked a lot with my local representatives um, in those those aspects of government. Um, I was involved in student government. I did um, a lot with Rotary Club. Um, I did a lot of community service and animal shelters, um, the hospital. Um, yeah, just a bunch of things all over. So um, I, I definitely wasn't like super focused in one area. Um, but I think that those diverse opportunities allowed me to really um, discover what I'm passionate about. Um, and then I was able to carry that over to my current interests and um, activities that I do at BC now. If I can add to that, Sue, I think that um, Arub's right that it's presumably everyone who applies to Boston College and is, who is interested in Boston College is very involved in something because that tends to be the kind of students we attract. And I think that for our program in particular, it's not the necessarily the volume of what you're doing so much as it is as long as you're doing something that you really care about. And that comes across in your application. We have people who in high school only did like a couple things, but they really were huge change makers in that area. And then we have people who like did a million things because they loved all those things and they touched on all of them. But I think that one of the most crucial parts of the application is your essay and the ability that you have to communicate, for the program especially, to communicate that you wanna be someone to change the world. And it doesn't have to be in a super stereotypical way where you like wanna be president or you wanna be, you wanna work with Doctors Without Borders. Like I told them day one, I said, I just wanna be a teacher. That's all I ever wanna do. They're like, do you wanna go into policy? I said, no, I just wanna be a teacher. And I really felt like I wanted to change the world by teaching and that really came through in my essay. And I think that's the core for everyone who gets accepted is that they're really passionate about something and they wanna do something that changes the world. I have to say as a reader of applications generally, and this may not help the audience um, at all, but my hair stands on end when I'm reading the application and I get really excited. I say, I really, really, really wanna meet this student because they have interests and passions that are truly authentic um, and that don't feel programmed, but feel like that they are coming from them. And that's what I love and get excited to uh, bring to the table at committee. And then when the student gets to campus, um, get to see it in action in person. Um, so we have another couple questions in chat uh, that are asking about where, with these international trips, where do you guys go? Um, so the ones that are standard that you go during the breaks, and then some examples of um, you or your classmates when you've done your language placement summer, and then also kind of like internships if anybody did anything abroad or research abroad. I know that for, so last year during our freshman year, we were supposed to go to Italy. So that's a pretty standard freshman trip, going to Italy with your class as a bonding experience and a um, experience to go out of the country. And we were unfortunately not able to go due to COVID-19, but that is something we're still planning on making up, I think. And also for the summer after your sophomore year, you get to choose a country that you want to go abroad. And I'm hopefully going to South Korea. So that's where I'm thinking. 
And where do you go um, sophomore year, junior year, and then any any of your classmates with what they did for their language placements would be cool. Sophomore year, we always used to go to Nicaragua and then due to the political unrest, the recent political unrest, we switched to Costa Rica. And then the Middle East trip was very recently added, like two or three years ago. And the first year they went to, oh, help me, Sue, was it? Jordan. Where? Jordan. Jordan, there was Jordan. We were supposed to go to Kuwait last May and we right. didn't go to Kuwait. COVID kind of made a mess of some of the international stuff, but that's generally yeah. the plan. When there's no COVID, though, that's where you're headed. You go to Europe the first year, Latin America the second year, the Middle East the third year. And then my sophomore summer, I went to uh, Peru and I worked with children at a daycare for eight weeks, which was super fun. And uh, there were people who went to Mexico, uh, someone was in France. People go anywhere, anywhere where they can find something for themselves to do for eight weeks. You're able to go as long as you can propose it to the program. Yeah, I just want to follow up with what Jacob said. That, that was a question I had when I was applying actually was like, for that so sophomore summer, like, do they kind of push you into a certain country and say like, yeah, it's anywhere in the world, wink, wink. Like, no, it really is just like anywhere you can make a case for, you can go, which is really, really cool. So there's a great question that came through chat. Do you feel as if you're still able to participate in other activities outside of the Gabelli program? Definitely, definitely. Um, in terms of weekly commitments, we only have one meeting per week from seven to eight on Tuesdays. Um, Besides that, the program is really just a community for us to speak with one another, share ideas, um, form connections. Um, but beyond that, we're really just um, normal students. Uh, we go to class with everyone else. Uh, we do extracurriculars with everyone else. Um, there's no, it's not like we, you know, congregate and migrate together. Um, we're really just dispersed um, in the VC community. So yes, we're all involved in um, lots of different things throughout the community. Yeah, I think that's really important to note too, is that we're not, we're not a unit and you're not always with these people. Some of us are really good friends with one another and that's natural because we're all super cool people, I think. Um, but a lot of us also have a ton of other friends and we don't hang out with people in the program. So there's no pressure to just hang out with people in the program. Um, back to the travel, and I can kind of address this quickly, they asked why did we specifically choose Europe, Latin America, and the Middle East? And a lot of that actually has to do with um, the directors of the program. So for the last 10 years, uh, the director of the program was Father Jim Keenan, um, who knows Italy like the back of his hand and speaks Italian. And so that was part of why um, students went to Italy. And then he, as a Jesuit, was very, very connected to Latin America, particularly Nicaragua. Um, so that's why Latin America. Um, in the last couple of years, uh, Jim added a co-director to the program, Professor Kathy Bailey, whose expertise is in the Middle East. Um, so that is why the students go to the Middle East. And Jim actually um, did step down for the program to do other um, roles at Boston College. And Kathy Bailey is the director of the Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program. But we just had a really cool question pop in that um, is, if you could be president for only one day, what would your top priority, what would be your top priority in your agenda? So, I, I mean, it says president, I, you'd be president of anything. It's US, BC, you know, another country. Give me your, uh, each of you can jump in on that. What would your top priority be? I don't know if you all saw the clock. Um, I think Washington Post posted it, um, but there's a clock that's basically ticking that's showing the number of years that we have until um, the earth basically goes into disaster mode um, through various natural disasters. Um, so my top priority would definitely be different environmental causes. I think that clean water is a fundamental right. <laughs> And so many people in the U.S. still don't have it, let alone abroad in the world. Um, so definitely something in that realm. If, okay, if I were president of the U.S., I'd say that I would definitely, um, first thing on the agenda would be increasing funding for K-12 public schools. I went to a public high school, and I think that there's a lot of work that could be done there to um, do some pretty cool things um, with just a little bit more money. I'm 
I'm going to echo Fran because I'm a teacher and I also think that my first priority would be education. But in addition to funding, which I think we of course need more funding, I think the structure surrounding our public education system needs a lot of revamping and even independent of partisan politics at all, there's just a lot of disorganization and it needs to be straightened out. And I think that the public education system has a lot of potential and it's just not being used to that full potential. Um. I'm not really sure. I like, I'm like, but I think more sort of echoing what Arub was saying um, about our, or just like climate change and environment in general, and also more specifically related to the environment, things related to environmental racism and race issues, which I consider to be a public health crisis. So anything addressing those situations that are being exacerbated by our current pandemic. So. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm just going to throw it to a different aspect of the GPSP. Um, your weekly meetings often have speakers, um, and then you also have opportunities to kind of bond as a class and do things in Boston together. So can each of you, I know, Fran, this is not necessarily you just got there, um, but you can think ahead and maybe talk about what you are excited for. But if the other of you guys can talk about maybe your favorite event that you've done as part of the GPSP. And, and Fran, you can say the selection process and how cool that was too, if you want. Last year, um, I think Jacob came with us, but we went to <laughs> we went to an escape room as a class, and we split into two groups, and it was so much fun. It was our first like big bonding experience, and I, I think the program. My favorite part of it is just making closer friends with the people in the program. I'm actually, rooming with one of the other girls in our um, in my grade and right next door is another kid in our grade. So, I mean, you get very close to the people and the activity activities we do like help you get closer. My favorite thing that we do is um, we always have a cultural outing and we tend to go see a show in Boston and I'm a big theater person. And last year we got to go see Fiddler on the Roof, which I just loved. It was a great production. And I love that they take us to see theater in Boston because that's something that can be very niche for different people and not everyone thinks, oh, I'm going to go see theater in Boston. But when the program's like, we're going to take you on a cultural outing, they often do that and I love when they take us there. Yeah, during Prosby weekend, which for those of you who don't know what that means, it's when the prospective scholars come and are interviewed. Um, we always go to dinner and then usually like a show or something like that. Um, and I think your year, uh, Julia, whenever you were a Prosby, uh, we went to dinner at Uno's, I believe, and then we went to go see Carol King the Musical, which was a super fun time. <laughs> yeah, I definitely echo what Arub said. Um, that was where I met some of the older um, scholars, and like, there's some pretty cool people out there, and um, that got me really excited to go to BC for sure. Even if I didn't get into the program, I was like, I like these kids. So yeah, definitely Prosby Weekend. And um, I think we've got time for just one more question. Um, and I'm going to combine a couple things. Um, what is something that makes you excited to be part of the Gabelli program every day? And then connected to that, I want you guys to think a little bit about back to high school. And what advice would you give students who are thinking, not just specifically about Gabelli, but about merit programs in general and applying for them, um, you know, kind of your process and, and what advice would you give them if they're thinking about that? So, you know, what makes you excited about GPSP every day? Um, and then advice for those applying for merit scholarships. I can go first. Um, I think I'm most excited about the fact that I'm part of a community where so many people have so many different viewpoints and perspectives and interests and everyone's different, yet everyone really wants to shake up the world in a really positive way, in their own way. Like that, being with a group of change makers like that so uh, intimately is very unique and it's very humbling and very inspiring in so many ways. And we have a big group chat, all 60 of us, and I just love seeing everyone talk about what they're doing all the time. It's just very fun. Um, and my biggest piece of advice is absolutely, which I'm sure most of us feel, is to be yourself. The, the urge is to really try and become someone you're not to impress the people who are judging you and doling out the scholarships. 
but it's so clear when someone's not being themselves. Even if you think you're so good at faking it, it's really easy to tell. And all anyone wants is to pick someone who's very genuinely, genuinely themselves and passionate about something. And even if you think it's not impressive, your passion about it is impressive. Yeah, similar to Jacob, I would say the thing that um, inspires me every day is um, just being able to experience everything that my peers in the program are doing. Um, and just being part of this community whose sole purpose is to empower us so we can move forward after BC and um, change the world in however big or small way that may be. Um, so I love the focus on social justice that the program brings. Um, it's apparent through our weekly meetings, through our international trips, um, and I think that that's something that often can be absent from um, merit-based programs. Um, so I think just being with such smart people coupled with um, the focus on volunteer service, um, social justice is, is super duper inspiring. Um, and then I, I would say oh, in terms of advice, um, just continue doing what you're passionate about. Um, don't change for your application like what I was saying before. Um, and uh, now senior year is the time to like get involved in things that maybe you haven't done previously. Um, so just, yeah, just follow your heart. <laughs> Um, I would say what I'm most excited about is just kind of when you're walking on campus and then you see another Peace Scholar and then you're able to like wave and talk to them, even if you're not close, like with them in your grade. It's just knowing that you have this community behind you no matter what. And you have these friends that like are always going to be happy for your successes and genuinely want you to succeed. And in terms of advice, not just about the Gabelli program, but in merit scholarships in general, I would say like look at all of them, go to the interview weekends, like compare all of them and genuinely just choose the one that you feel like is best for you. Because I remember coming home from this weekend, um, our selection weekend, I called my parents and I said, if I get the scholarship, I'm going to VC. And that's kind of just how I made my choice. And I, I'm really happy about the choice I made. Yeah, I definitely say what Julia said. Um, with just kind of walking around campus, even behind masks for me, um, you see people that you recognize and you're like, hey, that's kind of cool. Like I know an upperclassman just as a freshman, that's huge for me each day. And I would say my best advice for everyone would be to go crazy with your passion. So even if you think that it's something that no one's going to care about and you're like, oh, like this is stupid. Like if I put this on a college app, like people are going to laugh at me. Like, no, if you are really involved in it, um, just run with it because odds are someone else will probably find it pretty cool too. Thank you so much, everybody. It was, again, a joy for me to see all of you, even virtually. Um, miss you all and glad that you're here. But we're going to throw this back to Grant to wrap up our session. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Sue. Well, allow me to uh, join Sue and the four of you. This has uh, really been just a really special uh, afternoon and a really great program. So we thank you for being here. Sue, thank you so much for moderating and thank you to all of you for the questions that you posed. I hope this has been helpful to you. I hope that you will choose to continue to engage with us. Uh, our Discover Boston College program continues on Monday night with a whole slate of programs this coming week that are just going to be a lot of fun. Uh, talking about uh, Boston College traditions, the Jesuit Catholic mission of Boston College, hearing from a panel of international students, some programs specific for AHANA students, our underrepresented uh, students here at Boston College, programs uh, for students that might be applying as a first generation student. So there are really just some remarkable programs coming up and we hope that they help you continue to learn about Boston College. We hope that they will help you better understand the culture uh, at Boston College as well. So we are again, are so grateful that you joined us this evening. We thank you for your time. We hope you have a great weekend. And if you are football fans, we hope you'll tune in at six o'clock as Boston College takes on Texas State tonight. It'll be a great game. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.